Hello and welcome to this edition of Wineskins, a program that features reflections on the lives of the saints and sacred scriptures, along with information on topics and issues from a Catholic perspective. I'm Father Jim Corda. Wineskins is brought to you by the annual Dosses and Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts, a division of the Society of St. Paul. On our show today, I will interview Guy Burney from the First Friday Club. We will also look at the life of St. Agatha, as well as reflections on the readings for this fifth Sunday in Ordinary Time. That and more coming up on Wineskins. In our Bishop's Corner, we will welcome Sister Joyce Canditti. With me again is Sister Joyce Canditti, who is the former director of the Office of Religious for the Diocese of Youngstown. Welcome back to our show. Thank you, Father. It's just great to be here. And uh, Sister, you're going to embark on another job in Rome. We certainly wish you well in your new position there. We're going to miss you, just so you know that you go with our thoughts and prayers and love. But prior to that, we want to talk about this World Day for Religious, which is a great time to lift up religious and consecrated life in the church. Why is that important for us as a local church to do that? Right. I think, you know, Locally or universally, I think it's just very important that we stop, you know, we all of us kind of have, live frenzied lives, you know, we're busy going here and there. And the church in her wisdom allows us to stop and pause and take stock. And so she has these various celebrations, World Day for Consecrated Life or World Day for Families or World Day for Priests, etc. And so it's important for us just to stop and to think about the gift that God has given us, the gift of consecrated life, and to be able to say thank you to a religious sister, brother, or priest, you know, for saying yes to the Lord. And in addition to that, to also say, you know, how am I doing in my own family? How are my own, my relatives, my own children maybe, in terms of responding to such a call? Do they understand what religious life is? And it's a time for, I think, as a church, locally in a a very special way, because we're always praying for vocations to priesthood, consecrated life, but to look at that and to not take such a wonderful gift for granted and on many levels. Sister, for many years you work with religious men and women. What has been one of your greatest joys in working with them over these last many years? First of all, in my entire 22 and, and some years working with religious in our diocese has been a great joy with me, particularly just my most enjoyable event was celebrating the religious jubilees mm. of our religious women and men. To see these persons who served, uh, you know, really faithfully for 25, 50, mm-hmm. 60, some of them 70 years, has always been just an inspiration to me. Just watching them, celebrating with them has given me energy and joy to want to continue with my own vocation. And what would be some of the challenges that lie ahead for religious life? Well, I think one of the challenges, once again, is really to, you know, to see how is each institute going to carry on its charism. And many of the religious orders have been very creative and also very have done something very wonderful, and that is to invite laity to come in as lay associates. And these are phenomenally dedicated women and men who love the charism of that particular institute. Maybe the sisters or the brothers taught them, and they want to continue that on. But aside from that, it's also a big challenge is to also also be open to and encourage vocations of young women and men who will really make that personal commitment to continue the institute and the charism of that institute as vowed members. Mm -hmm. One of the areas that we'd like to talk about is the Jubilee year. We know that we're embarking on that. Jubilees, as you had mentioned, in the lives of us is significant. Why is celebrating anniversaries and and jubilees so crucial in the life of the church? I think when you look look at the history of the church's, Catholic church's jubilee years, Mm -hmm. they were always meant, I think, to be a source, first of all, be a source of reconciliation, Mm -hmm. drawing people back to God. It's a time of forgiveness, if you will, so you know that the church is opening her arms and saying, you know, come back home and you know, be free of anything that maybe you, of any guilt, and to also to re- reconcile with your own brother, your own sister. So that, that jubilee is just a time when the church actually focuses 
on that aspect of reconciliation. Once a person is reconciled, as we all know, especially through the sacrament of reconciliation, you leave the confessional just so so rejuvenated and so free. And this is something, as human beings, mm-hmm. it is so very necessary for us to continue. The theme, I know, is Pilgrims of Hope. Yes. What does that say? I think it says that we live in a world right now where maybe we need a lot of we need a lot of hope. Mm-hmm. Too many people are hopeless, mm-hmm. discouraged. I mean, we look at the news and we, we see this. But as Catholics, as people of faith, as a universal church, we are people of hope. That means that Jesus Christ suffered and died on the cross, that evil has in fact been conquered, and that the church will prevail. But we are the instruments, we are the members of that church to bring that hope. And hope is rooted on the re- a reality of truth. And the truth is that God loves us and God is in charge. Sister, you said it so beautifully. Sister Joyce Canditti of the Oblates of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, we wish you well in your new position with the community over in Rome. Please know of our continued prayers for you and your community. And as a priest, I want to thank you because I know your charism is to care for priests and to pray for priests. And in this changing world that we live in, we certainly need and welcome your prayers. So thank you so much. You're most welcome. Thank you. For Wineskins, I'm Father Jim Corda. The church celebrates a feast of St. Agatha on February 5th. To tell us more is Lou Jack Kay. He is from St. Brendan Church in Youngstown. St. Agatha. Agatha suffered martyrdom in Sicily in the year 250 and was venerated at Milan, Rome, and Ravenna, and also in the East. Although the account of her martyrdom is of little historical value, it was the source for the antiphons and responsorials of the form of breviary. The cult of St. Agatha is very ancient. A church was constructed in her honor at Rome in the 5th century and at the beginning of the 6th century, Pope Symmachus introduced her feast into the liturgy at Rome and dedicated a basilica in her honor. The inclusion of her name in the Roman canon of the Mass is attributed to St. Gregory the Great. The devotion of numerous popes to St. Agatha is possibly based on the legend that St. Peter appeared to her to console her and heal her. She had been tortured on the rack and her breasts had been cut off. A few days later, she was rolled naked over burning coals. Her last prayer to Christ was, Receive my soul, after which she breathed her last. It is believed that through St. Agatha's intercession, Sicily was miraculously saved from an eruption of Mount Etna. Consequently, she is invoked against any outbreak of fire. The opening prayer of the Mass is taken from the two prayers contained in the Gregorian Sacramentary, and it emphasizes the glory associated with virginity and martyrdom. Martyrdom reveals the power of God that triumphs over the weakness of creatures through the operation of the gifts of fortitude. The merit of chastity derives from the cooperation of the individual person with the grace of God. The Office of Readings is taken from the homily by St. Methodius, a native of Sicily and patriarch of Constantinople. He describes St. Agatha as a bride and a virgin. Quote, to use the analogy of Paul, she is the bride who has been betrothed to one husband, Christ. A true virgin, she wore the glow of a pure conscience and the crimson of the lamb's blood for her cosmetics, unquote. In the same homily, St. Methodius says, Agatha, the name of our saint, means good. Agatha, her goodness, coincides with her name and way of life. She won a good name by her noble deeds, and by her name she points to the nobility of those deeds. Agatha, her mere name, wins all people over to her company. She teaches them by her example to hasten with her to the true good, God alone. In the face of the modern sexual revolution, this feast has special significance and stressing the importance of the virtue of chastity for every state of life. This is readily seen in the unbloody martyrdom of consecrated virginity, which is especially meritorious. However, all Christians, even if they are married, should practice chastity in accordance with their condition and state of life. Finally, as in the Middle Ages, St. Agatha should be invoked by those women who are suffering from the diseases of the breast. The opening prayer states, Lord, let your forgiveness be won for us by the pleading of St. Agatha. 
who found favor with you by her chastity and by her courage in suffering death for the gospel. For Wineskins, I'm Lou Jack Hayward. Joining me is Guy Burney, who is the executive director for the Community Initiative to Reduce Violence for the City of Youngstown. Welcome to our show today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I first want to applaud you and thank you for the wonderful work that you do in this position. It's not only necessary, it's great work for the City of Youngstown for us to know that you're addressing these issues. And when we talk about violence, Unfortunately, that presupposes that there's violence in our communities. Why do we have violence in our communities? What's kind of the root cause of all that? Well, violence is, uh, there's a gentleman in one of my favorite books named Solomon Mm -hmm. who says there's nothing new under the sun. Mm -hmm. So there's always been violence. As we go back to Cain and Abel, murder rate was 50% at the beginning. And so violence is not a new phenomenon, Mm -hmm. but we find in certain environments around this country that violence is exasperated and it and increases because of people's survival rate, the way they handle conflict, mm-hmm. and then just many other environmental issues. Do you think that sometimes our, our cities in general kind of have a bad rap because when people visit cities around the country, they think, oh, I've got to be so careful. Don't you think some cities get a bad rap sometimes? Yeah, many times. What I've noticed, though, the bad rap comes internally. Oh. And so what we have to be careful of as, as cities are making sure that we're valuing what we have and, and really comparing it and realizing what we have. I tell officers, community members, we can't always take on national narratives in our local setting, right? We need to see what's going on here address it, respond to the challenges, and make sure we're doing that. So yes, we do get bad raps, but I believe it's a a huge perception issue. We do have violence, and if you are making wrong decisions, it's coming. Mm -hmm. But if you're living your life and making good choices and doing the things that you're supposed to, taking care of your family, taking care of yourself, we notice those numbers decrease dramatically. You know, obviously the pandemic had a lot of issues for us and and we found ourselves being isolated. And that sense of isolation mm-hmm. put some people at a greater risk. Yes. And so what did your organization do to help people who were at risk, especially during that time? That's a great question. So one of the things we partnered with many of the activities that the diocese does, we provided food with our partner from Action. Mm-hmm. We went around. We wanted to be safe, mm-hmm. but we made those connections. But when we were there handing out food and supplies, we also wanted to know how is your mental health? Mm-hmm. Uh, how are the children doing in your home? And we responded with community resources as well. Sure. We also did a many virtual activities for our young people. We actually held a virtual conference more than 100 young people on, and we spent the day where they can just get information and play games and connect to each other, and we gave positive messages. I'd like to talk about the young people now because sometimes the young people tend to get a bad rap because mm-hmm. we always think that they're mischievous and there's all they're always getting in trouble, but we have to give young people credit Absolutely. because I think sometimes in this complex world that we live in, young people struggle. They look for identity. They look for answers to their many questions. They look for stability. What does your organization do to help young people in particular? So we have many ways to do that. We have mentoring. Now, let me say this. I think I'm free to say it. Family is so important. Sure. We create programs all over the place, and I've been a part of it. I've been recognized nationally. But what I realize is we're trying to recreate family Mm. with programs Mm -hmm. it's very difficult to do Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. and so one of the things that we want to make sure is my programs concentrates on the family Mm -hmm. so we deal with men and mothers because we know if we can stabilize that institution that the kids do better now when kids are unfortunate and they have parents who have passed away or parents who are incarcerated, Mm -hmm. that's when we step in with mentoring programs and youth leadership programs to try to fill that gap to stabilize lives. 
let's go back to that whole concept of the family. Mm -hmm. You know, family life has really changed over the years. Yes. You know, family used to be mom, dad, kids, right. but family has changed. It's, it's totally different. And so how do we understand that family is different and yet it's the same? Yeah, it's, it's, so the structure mm -hmm. may be different depending on where you come from, mm -hmm. but the needs have not changed from the family. So right. if you just have a mother, you still have those basic needs that need to help you develop into a healthy adult, right? If you just have a father or you may be raised by your grandparents or your aunts, sure. fostering is huge and adopting is huge. And I know yeah. many young people who have been adopted and they're doing very well. Why? Because it just takes a positive adult in the life of a young person to make the difference. Mm -hmm. What would you like to tell the folks that are with us who might want to be helpful? What can they do on the grassroots level to really help, especially with this whole issue of, of violence? Again, I'm with the church today, so I feel I am a, a minister at heart. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that Jesus told us when he was leaving is he said, I want you to be witnesses. Yeah. But he said, I want you to start in Jerusalem. So what I encourage people to do is start where they are. Right. Start in your own home where you can connect to people. Um, you have relatives that are going one way or another. Mm -hmm. That is a perfect opportunity to put your hands around a young person and provide what you have they need. So that's where I will start. It's not going to be this huge process. It's going to be these little tiny events mm -hmm that connect to people that are going to make the change because you're going to change a life and that life changes a life. And that's how it works. And I like the idea of involving the church because we are Absolutely. the church. All of us yes. uh, through our holy baptism are, are called to witness. We're called to be role models. Absolutely. We're called to really be involved in, in our families yes. and in the greater family, which yes. is our communities. Right. Give us some words of, of encouragement that the work that you're doing is truly helping our communities for not only stabilization, but just to witness to one another as a family. Oh, that's great. So I'm a storyteller, so I'll tell a small story sure. that's really helpful, and I hope it helps your audience. There was a father, he wanted to teach his daughter how to overcome adversity. So that could be violence or conflict. And he said, water stands for conflict and adversity. Mm -hmm. And this is what he said. He said, take three items, boil them very quickly. It was a potato, egg, and a coffee bean. Mm -hmm. She boiled them. It got done. He says, fill these items. Tell me what they are. She felt the potato, and she says, Dad, it was really hard. Now it's soft. Mm -hmm. She felt the egg. She said it was really fragile on the inside. Now it's hard on the inside. Mm -hmm. The coffee bean, though, seems to be the same. He said, this is how you handle adversity. Don't be a potato. Don't let adversity cause you to stop trying, caring, putting forth the energy to help. He said, but don't be an egg. Don't let things in life harden your heart so you don't have empathy anymore. She said, okay, that's great, but the coffee bean didn't change at all. He said, look at the water. She looked at the water. She smelled it. She said it's a different color. She says, the water changed. The coffee bean didn't. He says, baby, you're a coffee bean. <laughs> Don't let the world change you. You change the world. Great story. Guy Bernie, Executive Director for the Community Initiative to Reduce Violence in the City of Youngstown. Thank you so much for your presence. My pleasure. Thank you so much. For Wineskins, I'm Father Jim Corda. For more information and to listen to Wineskins, visit the website catholicecho.org. Stay with us. We'll be back in a moment. The new Catholic Echo podcast will inform and entertain the faithful of the diocese by discussing various topics that are relevant in the church today. Bishop David J. Bonner begins the podcast with your host, Father Jim Corda, on the topic of the day, and then you'll hear from others with expertise on that topic. You can listen to the Catholic Echo podcast on Sundays at 6.30 a.m., on WHOT-FM 101, WYFM-FM 102.9, WQXK-FM 105.1, or catch it online by going to catholicecho.org slash podcast. 
The Catholic Echo Podcast is produced by the Communications Department of the Diocese of Youngstown. The song we have for you today is called Thank You, Lord. It is by Gregory Koleski. In the early light of morning, I cried so hard today, but I felt you by my side anyway. Only you know the love inside my heart. Please let my light dispel the dark and have your way. Jesus, tell me what you want me to hear. Have your way. Jesus, can you make it perfectly clear? Cause every now and then I can see it. You revealing another piece of your plan. Lord, I can actually feel it. Ooh, it's like I'm in the palm of your hand. This fallen world around me is so devoid of truth. Yet each day I'm trusting in you. Help me bring your love to all unselfishly. Open up your imprint in me and have your way. Jesus. Tell me what you want me to hear Have your way Jesus Can you make it perfectly clear Cause every now and then I can see it You revealing another piece of your plan Lord, I can actually feel it Ooh, it's like I'm in the palm of your hand When I leave this time, I'm coming home to you. Yes, I know you helped me make it through. When my time is done, tell all the friends I've made that my love for them will never, ever fade. And have your way, Jesus. Tell me what you want me to hear. Have your way, Jesus. Cause every now and then I can see it You revealing another piece of your plan Lord, I can actually feel it Ooh, it's like I'm in the palm of your hand Have your way, have your way Have your way And to tell us about the scriptures for this fifth Sunday in Ordinary Time is Deacon Mike Kajancic. He is from St. Charles Church in Boardman. I knew when my mom meant it, really meant it, I would hear Mike, Michael. But when I heard her declare Michael Anthony Lewis, I knew that she controlled me. It was an old notion that the saying the name of an opposing spirit, you controlled that spirit. This is the reason why we hear in today's gospel that Jesus did not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. It was a way of saying, don't waste your time trying that with me. I only listen to the voice of Yahweh, my father. But perhaps more importantly, he didn't want them to tell the crowd who he really is. Jesus wanted the crowd to discover that for themselves. We read many times where Jesus asked that his identity be kept secret because the answer lied in how they saw him. Was he just a miracle worker, a healer, a magician, a superman, an instant fix-it person? Did they focus on just the miracles? For if they did, they were missing the true meaning of who he was. That's why the command to stay silent until the rest of the story is told, when who he really is will be revealed with his death and resurrection. Today's gospel accounts for one and a half days in the life of Jesus. He cures Peter's mother-in-law. He cures all the ill and possessed who are brought to him. And no words or formulas are needed, just his touch. The next morning he rises and goes to a deserted place to spend time in prayer for strength before he's ready to leave. Maybe that's something we all should do instead of rushing in to get things done. We should find a deserted place in our lives 
a place for prayer, listening, and connecting with God. For we know that God speaks in the silence. Then Simon appears and says, everyone is looking for you. And Jesus says, let's move on so others can hear the good news. Jesus does not cure all, not because he doesn't care. He cares very deeply. But the greatest gift is not the miracles or freedom from possession by demons. The greatest gift is that God is with us in our suffering. God sent his son not to stop all sin or sickness, but he sent Jesus to show us how to get through it, how to go through life. We may look for wonderful cures, miraculous answers, speedy solutions. We may want a Superman with a cape, but we get Christ with a cross, a wonder worker, one who has authority, who passes through death to bring new life. Jesus brings not a cure, a remedy for disease, but a healing, a restoring to soundness. We gather together to pray as Jesus did for strength in the days ahead, to be fed with the real food that gives real life. And that's not always easy. We want cured now. We question, you cured others, why not me? I don't know the answers to these questions. Job in the Old Testament asked for specific answers, but God answered to have faith. So we have a choice. We can listen to the demons who call us by name in order to gain mastery over us with a quick cure, or we can listen for the quiet voice, whispering our names with love and strength. Which voice will you listen to? For Wineskins, I'm Deacon Mike Kajancic. During our days and times of despair and discouragement, I trust that you and I will have the wisdom to hold on to our faith in God. Life can never defeat us. It will get us down, but it will never be able to keep us there. Wineskins is made possible through the annual Diocesan Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts. The program is produced by the Roman Catholic Diocese of Youngstown. I'm Father Jim Corda saying thank you for being with us. Have a blessed week. And we of Wineskins want to express our thanks and prayers to all women and men religious today. What have you done for your marriage today? I gave my wife a hug this morning. I thought uh, I love her. I uh, did her hair this morning. I think it looks pretty good. <laughs> I cooked my husband's uh, favorite breakfast. I bought her an orchid. What have I done for my marriage today? I sent my husband a love email. I read the newspaper to my wife and it cracked her up. She's, but she's still laughing. <laughs> what have you done for your marriage today? Make a change for the better. Need help? Go to foryourmarriage.org. A message from the Catholic Church. They say America is the land of opportunity, but for some, life isn't so easy. Right now in America, one in six children lives below the poverty line. That's nearly 13 million children of all races all across our country. Where do you draw the line and get involved? You can make a difference in more ways than you think. Go to povertyusa.org today because one in six children in poverty is one too many. A message from the Catholic Campaign for Human Development.